the year 1848. The locale, New York City, humming with life, yet the Astor Mansion stood in a cold contrast, its aura of regality offering a muted hush. John Jacob Astor, his legendary family's first magnate, lay on his bed, life flickering like a dying candle. The bed, resplendent in silk and rich mahogany, was an ironic setting for a man who began his journey in the ruggedness of Waldorf, Germany, and the son of a simple butcher. His saga, powered by a monumental spirit, led him across the Atlantic, driven by dreams too large for his small German hamlet. From fixing musical instrumentals to peddling fur, from dabbling in fledgling real estate to mastering finance, he embroidered his success into the fabric of a new world, weaving a legacy in golden threads. Now his son William stood sentinel at his bedside, eyes hard, matching his father's steel. An understanding passed between them, as silent as the room, and as profound as the coming inheritance. Make it grow, William, the old Astor rasped, a lifetime of victories and struggles faintly echoing in his voice. Yet little did he know that his earthly departure would not mark the end of an era, but the beginning. It would be not only an immense fortune he passed on to his son William, but the seeds of a transatlantic empire. In today's video at Old Money Luxury, we shall recount the incredible true life story of the Astors, America's first old money family, from the dusty roads of rural Germany, to the hallowed halls of Westminster, to the affluent avenues of the city that never sleeps. So settle in and join us as we describe how the Astor family went from new money to old money. In the rural enclave of Waldorf, nestled near the regal city of Heidelberg, now part of contemporary Baden-Württemberg, Germany, a son was welcomed into the world in 1763. The newborn, christened John Jacob Astor, was the youngest scion of Johann Jacob Astor, a humble butcher, and Maria Magdalena von Berg. At the tender age of 16, John Jacob departed his home for the bustling city of London, where he fell under the tutelage of his uncle in the art of crafting musical instruments. Our lovely English capital, in its grandeur, not only provided Astor with proficiency in English, but also a robust apprenticeship in the realm of commerce. The year 1784 marked Astor's embarkation to the United States, his pockets filled with little more than hopes and a collection of several flutes for sale. He chose New York City as his new home, where he opened a small but ambitious shop trading in furs. The 1794 Jay Treaty, which allowed Americans to trade in Canada, served as a catalyst from which to build the empire that would come to create America's first old money family. By the turn of the century, Jacob had accumulated a fortune of six million dollars, an eye-watering amount of wealth for an era where America was less than 20 years old and reigned as the luminary of the fur trade. He then diversified his portfolio, trading furs for Chinese tea and investing in Manhattan's burgeoning real estate market, becoming a notable figure in fur transactions in China. Additionally, John Jacob's brother Henry, an enthusiast of equine racing and a German immigrant like himself, purchased a thoroughbred messenger who had journeyed from England to America in 1788. This noble steed would sire all standard bred horses in America, adding a unique chapter to the Astor family legacy. Now, the demise of Meriwether Lewis in 1809 ignited a quest for an able governor for the area. Astor saw an opportunity proposing a daring plan to monopolize and extend the fur trade to the Pacific. His venture employed Wilson Price Hunt, a St. Louis businessman, to lead an overland expedition to the Columbia River. The journey, though fraught with disastrous decisions, inadvertently led to seminal discoveries and paved the path known today as the Oregon Trail. This venture formed the bedrock for American development of Oregon and Washington. You see, Astor's empire held a near monopoly on the fur trade, and by the 1820s, it stood as one of the largest enterprises in the nascent United States. Yet, by 1834, the illustrious Astor exited the company he had built, partially due to a shift in fashion trends leading to the decline of fur's popularity, causing the company to fragment. However, by then, Astor had already acquired the title of America's very first multimillionaire and the world's richest man. Now, John Jacob Astor's demise on the 29th of March, 1848, marked the end of an era. With a fortune worth a staggering $20 million, Astor passed as the richest person in America. 
To give a perspective on how wildly large this fortune was in today's terms, if we compare Astor's wealth to the gross national product of America at that time, his net worth would be similar to a 2023 sum of $121 billion, competing with only the likes of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk on the world stage. And John Jacobs' penchant for philanthropy was equally illustrious, dedicating $400,000 from his coffers to the establishment of the Astor Library, the esteemed institution that would later coalesce with the Lenox Library to become the iconic New York Public Library. Now his firstborn son, John Jr. from birth, was plagued by a disheartening blend of ill health and mental issues, thus leading to John Jacob's will giving him an allowance just adequate to assure his sustenance in the uncertain times ahead. Therefore, the lion's share of the Astor's immense wealth, coupled with the destiny of their family empire, was bestowed upon the capable shoulders of his second son, William, thus positioning the next move on the grand chessboard towards old money dominance the Astor family would play in this game of familial intrigue. Now, William Backhouse Astor Sr., named after William Backhouse, his father's merchant friend, over the course of his life would prove his mettle as a competent associate in his father's prosperous export enterprise, all while carefully injecting capital into Manhattan's fertile soil of real estate. Emboldened by his family's already legendary business reputation, William amplified the empire's real estate portfolio, erecting over 700 stores and homes in the growing New York City. His real estate ventures around Central Park yielded exponential growth for the family assets, Understand William, an astute operator himself, not merely preserved, but managed to multiply the Astor family fortune. His diligent endeavors led to even more prosperity for their lineage, his legacy culminating in a staggering estate valued at nearly $50 million. It was as though Midas himself had passed his golden touch onto the next Astors, and they wielded this gift with expert precision. However, in the long arc of family law, the most crucial move William made was a defining characteristic of old money dynasties, strategic intermarriage. On the 20th day of May in the year 1818, he took the hand of Miss Margaret Alida Rebecca Armstrong, the children of Senator John Armstrong Jr. and Elida, sister to Horatio Gates Armstrong. From her mother's side, she claimed lineage from the renowned Livingston clan, her own mother the youngest offspring of the eminent Judge Robert Livingston and his wife Margaret. Furthermore, her pedigree included such luminaries as founding father Robert R. Livingston and Secretary of State Edward Livingston. On the other side, her father, John Armstrong Jr., held the distinguished title of President James Madison's second Secretary of War. From this impressive brood, William and Margaret's offspring would include a shockingly impressive third generation of Astors, to steer their colossal empire. John Jacob Astor III, born during a balmy summer's day on the 10th of June in 1822, would thrive as an American financier, generous benefactor, and a soldier in the American Civil War. His extraordinary business acumen served to bolster his personal fortune, much like his father and grandfather, eventually earning him the title of the richest amongst the Astor lineage from his generation. By the end of his reign, he would come to grow the family coffers to a stratospheric range between $75 million and $100 million, around $2.5 to $3.5 billion in today's dollars. Though again, we must remember that this was a time when the US had a much lower GDP than we have today, thus indicating that $3 billion back then may be closer to $80 or $90 billion relative to today's economies. John III's proudest achievement, however, lay in the establishment of the English branch of the Astor dynasty. It was this branch that cemented the Astor name amongst the British nobility, an enduring legacy that even to this day continues to take pride of place in the aristocratic circles, and we'll cover more in a minute. Now, William and Margaret's daughter, Laura Eugenia Astor, born in 1824, married to a man by the soon-to-be conspicuously American name of Franklin Hughes Delano on the 17th of September, 1844. This unforeseen twist of destiny would link the Astors with another echelon of the closest thing America has to royalty, the Roosevelts. Franklin Hughes was, after all, the namesake of a certain US president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This union also reinforced the Astors' ties with America's founding stock, given Franklin Hughes Delano's lineage traced back to Philip Delano, 
a pilgrim who set foot in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1621. Our tale now settles upon William Astor Jr., the bearing carrier of his forefather's illustrious American legacy. Yet it was actually his wife, the imposing Caroline Shermerhorn, who would seize the reins of New York's elite, sculpting the bedrock of its high society. Born to the privileged echelons of New York's Dutch aristocracy on September 22, 1830, Caroline, or Lina as she was affectionately known, was a Shermerhorn, offspring of the city's earliest settlers. Her father, Abraham Shermerhorn, had made his fortune in shipping and possessed a net worth of half a million dollars, a significant sum for the time, equivalent to $13.74 million today. Helen Van Cortland, nay white, of the prominent Shermerhorns, was her mother. Fate entwined Caroline Shermerhorn and William Astor Jr., the grandson of John Jacob Astor, in a harmonious union in 1853. An intriguing piece of history unfolded in 1862 when the couple commissioned a fashionable four-bay brownstone townhouse at 355th Avenue, an address that would later be home to none other than the Empire State Building. Now, contrary to popular perception that she was always more focused on high society than family, Mrs. Astor, for a considerable part of her years as a mother of young children, devoted herself to her family and household management. Additionally, a hefty inheritance from her parents afforded her a level of financial independence uncharacteristic for women of her era. As the years passed, Caroline Astor's sphere of influence, aptly known as the 400, emerged as a cornerstone of New York's Gilded Age society. You see, the city's population had swelled dramatically post-Civil War, with wealthy migrants and immigrants challenging the traditional stronghold of the New York elite. Teaming up with the revered social arbitrator, Ward McAllister, a kin of Samuel Cutler Ward, who had joined the Astor clan through marriage, Mrs. Astor began to shape the rules of decorum and select the acceptable newcomers to their esteemed circles. McAllister famously claimed that amidst the grandeur of Gilded Age New York, a mere 400 could truly qualify as members of fashionable society. The Queen of Society, as she came to be known, Mrs. Astor solidified her exclusive circle by throwing a grand annual ball on the third Monday of January. Scoring an invitation was seen as the ultimate accolade, the golden ticket confirming one's place within the glittering edifice of New York society. Caroline Astor during this era was renowned for her impeccable grace, scrupulous discretion, and a tongue that never courted controversy. Her amicable demeanor belied a certain detachment. She was never one for unsolicited intimacy, nor was she given to sharing confidences. Her social sphere was rigid, an unassailable bastion of old money, steadfastly unyielding in the maelstrom of changing times and values. Yet for all their staunch traditionalism, the Astor's fame reached far beyond their native shores, their names synonymous with the creme de la creme of the elite. The press found themselves inexplicably drawn to their lives, the grandeur, the scandals, case in point, the affair of Lady Caroline's attires. Much to the delight of the international press, Caroline Astor's sumptuous gowns, intricately adorned with apple green silk, velvet and ostentatious ostrich feathers, were intercepted by government agents under the suspicion of luxury duty evasion. Months of speculation followed as the world pondered whether Astor would capitulate to the looming charges of $300 to $400. Lady Astor remained adamantly defiant and, in the end, her gowns were put to auction. Curiously enough, it could be suggested that the Astors meticulously manufactured their connotation as old money, cleverly maneuvering the public's perception of older groups as new money. The quintessential example of this was their complex dynamic with the Vanderbilts. The Vanderbilts, a family known for wealth amassed rather than inherited, represented a form of opulence that the Astors found rather gauche and nouveau riche, particularly railroad money which was distasteful in the eyes of Mrs. Astor. As such, she found herself reluctant to entertain the Vanderbilt daughters. Yet, in 1883, she felt compelled to formally acknowledge the socially prominent Alva Erskine Smith, spouse of William Kissam Vanderbilt, granting the Vanderbilts access to the upper echelons of society. A popular tale swirling around the high society circles tells of Alva Vanderbilt orchestrating an opulent costume ball at her residence yet depriving young Caroline Astor, Lena's youngest, of her participation 
as Mrs. Astor had not extended a formal call. Observing the Vanderbilt's ascent, Lady Astor, foreseeing the strategic advantage of their alliance in maintaining the exclusivity of New York's high society, extended an olive branch and attended Alva's Grand Ball. Thereafter, the Vanderbilts were graced with invitations to Lady Astor's annual soiree, symbolizing their official ascension into New York's high society. For our more riveting and detailed account of the Vanderbilt's dramatic rise, fall, and subsequent resurrection, click the video on screen or visit the video description box, and we'll guide you through that immense saga. Now, after the demise of the indomitable Lady Astor, the role of reigning queen of New York society was a mantle too weighty for one woman. The responsibility fell upon the heavy shoulders of three ladies of prestige, Marion Graves' Anthon Fish, the genteel wife of Stuyvesant Fish, Teresa Fair Ulrichs, the glamorous spouse of Herman Ulrichs, and Alva Belmont, who had found a new companion in Oliver Belmont. In this same circle of power and affluence, Mrs. Astor's son, John Jacob Astor IV, a businessman of extraordinary prowess, writer, military officer in the Spanish-American War, sadly breathed his last in the calamitous sinking of the Titanic. With an estate valuing approximately $87 million, a fortune that would be the equivalent of $2.64 billion today, Astor was the wealthiest among the unfortunate souls on the ill-fated voyage, and arguably one of the world's richest men during his time. At the same time, on the other side of the pond, the Astor lineage grew nobler, cultivating its prestige through the illustrious titles of Viscount Astor and Baron Astor of Hever. First, a wealthy American Astor by the name of William Waldorf Astor took the bold step of transplanting himself to the British soils in 1891, later adopting the mantle of British citizenry in 1899. As a mark of his sterling contribution to the wartime charities, he was awarded a baronage in 1916 and elevated to a Viscount a year later. Thus was the birth of the Viscount Astor, granted by the peerage of the United Kingdom on a summer afternoon in 1917, forever intertwining the Astors with the annals of British nobility. In the mid-century year of 1956, another title was fashioned within the peerage of the United Kingdom. This was the title of Baron Astor of Hever awarded to the influential newspaper baron and conservative politician, another John Jacob Astor, the fourth offspring of William Waldorf Astor, first Viscount Astor. In today's world, certain Astor descendants, such as William Astor, fourth Viscount Astor, persist in wielding their influence, notably in the British House of Lords. However, the family fortune has been eroded over time, with certain heirs grappling with monetary hardships. One poignant symbol of this decline is the family's 420-acre estate, now wearing the signs of neglect due to insufficient maintenance funds. Thus, the Astor name, once synonymous with America's affluent uppermost echelons, has faced a gradual diminution in its prestige. While their mark on New York City's panorama and the American milieu remains indelible, their once venerated status has taken a quiet retreat. Yet for all their dwindling wealth and influence, the Astor lineage has left an indelible legacy on the city that never sleeps. The cityscape is peppered with edifices bearing the Astor insignia, including many streets, buildings and companies. Institutions like the modern St. Regis Hotel and the Astor, alongside various other landmarks, indeed echo their erstwhile glory. Therefore, the story of the Astor family's evolution from new money to old money serves as a potent reminder of both the importance of diversification and the transience of time and success, no matter what heights of success you reach. And, for what it's worth, the name Astor will always hold weight in the Western world. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Were you aware that the Astors were indeed America's first old money family? Additionally, which old money family would you like us to feature next? We can't wait to hear from you. And as always, Thank you for your continued viewership here at Old Money Luxury. Cheers, until next time.